Good morning, Team Alabama. We are ready for a little more in the Hunger Games. Please join me in Chapter 17. The impact with the hard-packed earth of the plane knocks the wind out of me. My backpack does little to soften the blow. Fortunately, my quiver has caught in the crook of my elbow, sparing both itself and my shoulder, and my bow is locked in my grasp. The ground still shakes with explosions, and I can't hear them. I can't hear anything at the moment, but the apples must have set off enough mines, causing debris to activate the others. I managed to shield my face with my arms as shattered bits of matter, some of it burning, rain down around me. An acrid smoke fills the air, which is not the best remedy for someone trying to regain the ability to breathe. After about a minute, the ground stops vibrating, and I roll on my side and allow myself a moment of satisfaction at the sight of the smoldering wreckage that has recent that was recently the pyramid. The careers aren't likely to salvage anything out of that. I'd better get out of here, I think. They'll be making a beeline for the place. But once I'm on my feet, I realize escape may not be so simple. I'm dizzy. Not the slightly wobbly kind, but the kind that it sends the trees swooping around you and causes the earth to move in waves under your feet. I take a few steps and somehow wind up on my hands and knees, and I wait a few minutes to let it pass, but it doesn't. Panic begins to set in. I can't stay here. Fight is essential, but I can neither walk nor hear. I place my hand to my left ear, the one that was turned around the blast that was turned toward the blast, sorry, and it comes away bloody. Have I gone deaf from the explosion? The idea frightens me. I rely as much on my ears as my eyes as a hunter, maybe more at times, but I can't let my fear show. Absolutely, positively, I am alive on every screen in Pan Am. No blood, no blood trails, I tell myself, and manage to pull my hood up over my head tie the cord around my chin with uncooperative fingers that should so help soak up the blood. I can't walk, but I can I crawl? I move forward tentatively. Yes, if I go very slowly, I can crawl. Most of the woods will offer insufficient cover. My only hope is to make it back to Rue's Copes and conceal myself in the greenery. I can't get caught out here on my hands and knees in the open. Not only will I face death, it's sure to be a long and painful one at Cato's hands. The thought of Prim having to watch that keeps me doggedly inching my way toward the hideout. Another blast knocks my, me flat on my face. A stray mine set off by some collapsing crate this happens twice more, and I'd remind it, I'm reminded of those last few kernels that burst when Prim and I pop corn over the fire at home. To say I make it in the nick of time is an understatement. I have literally just dragged myself into the tangle of bushes at the base of the tree when there's Cato barreling onto the plane, soon followed by his companions. His rage is so extreme it might be comical. So people really do tear out their hair and beat the ground with their fists. If I didn't know that it was aimed at me, at what I had done to him, add to that my proximity and my inability to run or defend myself, and in fact the whole thing has me terrified, I'm glad my hiding place makes it impossible for the cameras to get a close shot of me because I'm biting my nails like there's no tomorrow, gnawing off the last bits of nail polish, trying to keep my teeth from chattering. The boy from District 3 throws stones into the ruins and must have declared all the mines activated because the careers are approaching the wreckage. Cato has finished the first phase with his tantrum and takes out his anger on the smoldering remains by kicking open various containers. The other tributes are poking around in the mess, looking for anything to salvage, but there's nothing. The boy from District 3 has done his job too well. The idea must occur to Cato, too, because he turns on the boy and appears to be shouting at him. And the boy from District 3 only has time to turn and run before Cato catches him in a headlock from behind. I can see the muscles rip in Cato's arm as he sharply jerks the boy's head to the side. It's that quick, the death of the boy from District 3. The other two careers seem to be trying to calm Cato down. I can tell he wants to return to the woods, but they keep pointing at the sky, which puzzles me until I realize, of course, they think whoever set off the explosions is dead. 
They don't know about the arrows and the apples. They assume the booby trap was faulty, but that the tribute who blew up the supplies was killed doing it. If there was a cannon shot, it could have been easily lost in the subsequent explosions. The shattered remains of the thief removed by hovercraft. The, they retire to the far side of the lake to allow the games makers to review the body of the boy from District 3 and they wait. I suppose a cannon goes off. A hovercraft appears and takes the dead boy. The sun dips below the horizon and night falls. Up in the sky, I see the seal and know the anthem must have begun. A moment of darkness. They show the boy from District 3. They show the boy from District 10 who must have died this morning. Then the seal appears. So now they know. The bomber survived. It's the seal's light. I can see Cato and the girl from District 2 put on their night vision goggles or glasses. The boy from District 1 ignites a tree branch for a torch, illuminating the grim determination on all their faces. The careers stride back into the woods to hunt. The dizziness has subsided, and while my left ear is still deafened, I can hear a ringing in my right, which seems a good sign. There's no point in leaving my hiding place, though. I'm about as